Hello. For the last program in our series, we've come to Sunbury on Thames. This fine Georgian mansion is where the Salvation Army elects its generals. Our story has been about the first general and founder, William Booth. He knew poverty as a 13-year-old pawnbroker's apprentice in Nottingham, and for 60 years as an evangelist, his main concern was for the poorest of the poor. And yet, the rich and famous were proud to know him. Empire builders like Cecil Rhodes, the Rothschilds, the young Winston Churchill. In 1898, President Theodore Roosevelt invited him to open the United States Senate with a prayer. And King Edward VII asked to meet him. Now, Booth insisted on walking to Buckingham Palace after washing his hands in a workman's pail. So, no matter what the company, he never lost the common touch. And he always gave the glory to God. Booth makes nonsense of the theory that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. At 75, he was not too old to realize the value of the latest technology. The motor car offered a brand new way of meeting the people. The first of his seven motorcade tours took place in 1904 and lasted a month. Six cars bucketed 1,200 miles across England with the general in a red-wheeled napier. There were those who said it cheapened the gospel, but it caught the public imagination. Crowds stormed to hear him. Despite six, seven or more meetings each day, the old man kept going. Which wasn't always true of the cars. All right, ride on to glory, but what about us? He also saw the virtues of the cinematograph. On tour in the USA, the general wrote as many as 35 articles a day. Mind you, if you have a secretary like Fred Cox here, who'd get out of bed at four in the morning to take dictation, it helps. Fred had 43 pockets in his uniform. Whatever the general needed, lozenges for the throat or a spare set of dentures, it was there in one of Fred's pockets. Another great support was his daughter Evangeline, at that time national commander in the United States, who later became the army's fourth general. Booth traveled the world, to South America, the Far East and Japan. En route to Australia, he stopped off in the Holy Land and was rowed ashore at Jaffa. He saw many places familiar to him from his reading of the Bible and knelt to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed the night before he died. He climbed Mount Calvary where Christ was crucified and read a manifesto calling on all who named the name of Christ to make a desperate effort for the salvation of a lost world. Just how much that effort was needed was revealed in 1914, two years after his death when the world plunged into a bloody and terrifying war. Two world wars were to show that wherever the need, whatever the danger, the 
the Salvation Army would be there. Tens of thousands of servicemen and women still remember the Red Shield on its mobile canteens with affection. American lasses won a reputation for doughnuts cooked under battle conditions, but the majority by far declared there was nothing like an army cup of tea. I've never been what you might call religious. religious. All them hymns and prayers have no effect on me. On me. But when it comes to charm, that's a different tale by far. Oh, there's nothing like an army cup of tea. in this old wild world like a nice, hot, strong, psychedelic army. The public view of William Booth was one thing, but how did his family see him? At their Berkshire home, his two granddaughters, Olive and Dora, both in their 90s, had this to say. Our grandfather, he was considering, I think, the busy man he was, but whenever he was at home, he took notice of us. Of course, we remember him when he was fairly old, but we never called him grandfather. We always called him the general, and he always got a salute out of us. He, he loved that. We stood, or at least I stood, in great awe of him. Yes, we did a bit. Frightened the life out of me, for fear you displeased him. He, he, he was that sort of a man. He wasn't easy with you, I don't think. He was kind, but he, he jumped on you, rather. But otherwise, he was all out to, to, to get us to help him. He was always interested in what you did at the local call. How he, did you get on Even when we were really Sunday? quite children, he'd yes. ask you, did you go uh, to the meeting and what did they do and so on. But when, when you, you think small. what he had on his mind, I mean, the, the growing army, the, the great concern, all the problems, I think he was wonderful. 
We were seven, you know, at home, when we were small, really small. Catherine hadn't left. We always went to sing carols to him, and one Christmas morning, there must have been something extra thrilling in the stocking. We forgot all about him, <laughs> till we heard a terrific voice down below, and banging on the top of the, radi of the radiators like that, and saying, Christians awake and greet the happy born. And we were all paralyzed. <laughs> Another thing he did for the young people, which I think was very thoughtful, he had an annual meeting for, for all children of officers. And um, on one occasion, we acted for them. We did something. We all dressed up in different countries the costume costume of the different countries and passed him on the platform saying come and help us you know then he made a great appeal you see I need your help grow up and come and help me well I think an appeal like that can have a great impression when you're 11, 10, 13, 14, it's, it's, it's an appeal that, that lives with you. At any rate, it, it, I think it did with me. Oh, yes, it's a case of... It's a case of... of it did um, with me. Olive and Dora's uncle Herbert, the general's youngest son, made a very significant contribution to army music. Here's one of his best-known songs. At the cross where I first saw the light. For an outsider's view of the Salvation Army, I've come to talk to the Bishop of Manchester, the Right Reverend Stanley Booth Clibben. Well, I'm not quite an outsider, Roy. Uh, after all, although the old general died 12 years before I was born, I did know his eldest daughter, uh, Catherine, or Kate, very well, because she was my grandmother. But it was unfortunate towards the end your grandmother actually had a rift with her. Uh, with William Booth, didn't she? Yes, this was very tragic, really. In fact, three of the most brilliant of William Booth's uh, children, including my grandmother, left the army because they couldn't agree with um, the discipline and the way in which it was being run. And it was a matter of uh, very great sadness. He believed that um, as far as being a father was concerned, he was general of the Salvation Army first and he was a father second. And that what applied to the officers and soldiers of the Salvation Army ought to apply to his family just as much. I believe he was rather difficult to live with. He was a difficult man to live with. Some would say almost impossible. But I think this has been true for many of the greatest saints in the Christian church down through history. And it's one of the wonderful things about the Christian gospel and the Christian church that God can work through men and women who are very far from perfect. 
What do you think William Booth really did for Christianity? Well, first and foremost, I would put the fact that he always believed that action must go along with faith. Uh, he took the words of Jesus that um, men and women do not live by bread alone seriously uh, in the sense that there must be a spiritual dimension and evangelism was important. But he also took the words of Jesus about the need for people to have bread uh, to have decent conditions for their lives seriously as well and that's been a, a very important contribution in Christian history. And then secondly, I would say that the way in which William Booth reached out to the poorest and most marginalized in society was very important in the conditions of his time. And it's something which is a constant lesson to the churches. In fact, in our own Church of England, we're trying to follow um, this uh, message of the Christian gospel through our Faith in the City report, which cares for people in our uh, urban priority areas, in our great cities and urban areas. And then thirdly, it's back to what we were talking about. I would say the equality given to women in ministry along with men uh, was a very important lesson of the army in its early days. And of course, in the Church of England, we're really still wrestling with this one over the ordination of women to the priesthood. So I believe that that was another great contribution of William Booth. William Booth's last public appearance was in May 1912 at the Albert Hall. He was 83. He'd already lost one eye and was awaiting surgery on the other and would shortly go completely blind. And the old warrior was undaunted. Uh, I have to tell you, that I'm like an old ship going into dry dock for repairs. But never forget while women weep, as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry, or as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison, in and out, in and out, I'll fight while there's a drunkard left, while there's a poor lost girl upon the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight. I'll fight to the very end. Seven thousand Salvationists acclaimed him and sang the song that he himself had written, O oh, Boundless Salvation. later his earthly fight was ended and the general laid down his sword. Now the people gave their verdict on his life and work. A hundred and forty thousand attended his lying in state. Forty thousand people attended his funeral service and crowds fifteen deep lined the pavements. At the mansion house where Booth had been made a freeman of the city of London the Lord Mayor saluted the coffin. 10,000 Salvationists marched in procession and the flags were carried of more than 50 nations where the army was at work. The future Queen Mary attended the funeral unannounced and saw a one-time prostitute cast a rose on the coffin as it passed, saying, he cared for the likes of us.
had founded an army, but what of the future? I asked General Eva Burroughs about signs of hope. Is the Salvation Army still growing? Oh yes, you know, in many parts of the world it's amazing. In fact, in East Africa it's growing so fast we can hold, hardly hold on to it. And I was there just recently and they had a big Salvation Army march. All these Salvationists in white uniform, immaculate thousands of them and I'm standing up saluting for nearly an hour mm. when suddenly I felt a hand under my arm holding me up and I looked down it was the black hand of the Salvation Army African leader saying I'm helping you general but it's very thrilling Zimbabwe unbelievable Korea well really the Salvation Army has doubled its size in the last 10 years in many parts of the third world we are growing very rapidly in Europe the Salvation Army is like the main churches going through a period of difficulty but I believe we're seeing some of the embers of the fire really catching light now I believe we're going to see a swing in Europe and in Britain and when some people say the Salvation Army is just a social organization I have to correct them they make the long, same mistakes about Jesus Christ when you say to people who's Jesus Christ they say well he was such a wonderful man he he fed the hungry, he made the blind see, he was a noble example to follow, but they've missed the whole point. Jesus Christ came to reveal sin and show man a way to be reconciled to God. So that's our great point, be reconciled to God. If William Booth were here today, what would he say to the army? Well, I, I often get asked that question, you know, if William Booth came, I think he'd say, he, he would not say to us, are you doing what I used to do? I think he would come and say, have you got that same dynamic spirit, that spirit of aggression that, that's prepared to go out and invite people to come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ? Sure, I think in some ways the Salvation Army doesn't attract people as it did in its earliest days because we're in an entirely different social climate. But I think the Salvation Army has got his spirit and evangelism is our prime objective. And I think he'd say to me, go on girl, keep at it. Keep at it with gladness. Capture the mood and spirit of your day, but don't be led by it. Transform it. Use what it offers to bring the message of Jesus Christ alive to all people wherever they are.
end where we began here in Nottingham. The house where William Booth was born in 1829 is now a museum, but just a small part of a large modern complex which takes care of the elderly and helps the homeless and their families to learn how to face the future. But what typifies more than anything, I think, the spirit of William Booth is this emergency unit. It stands ready 24 hours a day, fully equipped for a mercy dash to a pile-up on a motorway, a rail crash, fire, flood, or any other disaster. For William Booth, the greatest disaster was a world that did not know its God. His response was immediate and urgent. All those who marched with him in his army and knew the love of God in their hearts must tell the world what they knew and show his love in action. Thank you.